All right, 21st century educators, welcome to another session. Yesterday we had a ton of fun with Fixer, and I hope those of you who were with us, you did go and have some more fun with that. So we are going to jump right in today. We are going to be talking about creating and engaging asynchronous lesson in MS Class Notebook. And of course, even if you are not using um, MS Teams, that's fine because you will still find a lot of the information is applicable to whatever platform you are using for your school. And as usual, if you have questions, we do have a Q&A section, but if you have questions or comments that you would want to make during the session, feel free to use the chat and then there will be times when I would stop and ask questions as well. So it's always a nice, you know, like to have interactive sessions because at the end of the day, I want you to be able to have some key takeaways by the time you leave. So let's jump right in. So let's get started a little bit about who I am. So yesterday, some of you would have met me. And of course, I know I'm seeing some familiar names, people who always attend all our sessions, so welcome. But I just wanted to take some time out to introduce myself in this particular context. So today, we're going to be talking about something in Microsoft called the Class Notebook. And you're probably wondering, well, why should I listen to this person, right? So I just wanted to give you a little insight. So I am actually an MIE, uh, Microsoft Innovative Educator Trainer. Um, and uh, I also have my master's in digital technology, communication, and education. I am the founder and director of 21st Century Educators. And I'm also certified in designing and facilitating e-learning. But the qualification that I have, that probably, that is not here, that is probably the one thing that I can actually say to you, I know what I'm going to tell you works, is because I've used it as a teacher for the last year and a half. And I've seen it work with my students, I've seen it work with the parents, I've shared it with other colleagues, and they too would have had the same experience. So I know we've had a lot of discussions about asynchronous versus synchronous and can it be as effective as in-person teaching and I'm here to say that yes you can have a successful asynchronous lesson and you can have an asynchronous lesson that is from primary school preschool as well as secondary school all of course with different approaches but there are basically some similarities throughout all right so let's jump right in. So just talking a little bit about what asynchronous is. And I know this is a term, you know, it's one of those terms that probably prior to COVID-19 was probably not part of our vocabulary, or at least most, most of us. And it, of course, now is like something very commonplace. So everybody's like asynchronous, synchronous, blended, you know, we're hearing all these terms. But oftentimes, part of the issue is that we are not getting proper definition of what these terms actually mean. So we want to start off by looking at what asynchronous actually means, and then we're going to dive into what an asynchronous lesson looks like, and specifically what it looks like in a class notebook for those of us who do use MS Teams. So let's start with the definition, right? Um, so we would talk about asynchronous basically means that the teacher and the student do not have real-time interaction. So synchronous would be, for example, when you're in a classroom, right? So you are with your students, or in an online environment, synchronous would be where you have, like what we're doing right now, this is a synchronous session. But an asynchronous session, there's no real-time interaction. So the students are able to access the work when it best suits their schedules, um, and when it, it best suits their ability to access the work, maybe because their shared device is happening or the internet works best at a certain time, because we know that happens, right? So asynchronous learning does not require real-time interaction. And there's been a lot of talk, and I've been hearing teachers using the term very loosely, you know, like asynchronous is where you spend the more work. Yes, it might be asynchronous, yes, but it's not an asynchronous lesson. Because just like in the real classroom, a lesson has certain components. And that's what we want to talk about today. So just very quickly in the chat, when you 
sent home an asynchronous lesson? What are some of the things you actually want to achieve? Or what are some of your biggest concerns or difficulties currently with asynchronous teaching? Um, if you prefer, you can raise, you can go ahead and unmute your microphone and you can give me the answers to any of these. Just some quick thoughts or you can actually put them in the chat. What do you want to achieve? When you post an asynchronous lesson, what do you want to achieve? And what are some of your biggest concerns or difficulties with asynchronous lessons right now? Anybody? And of course, you know, I'm going to call names, right? So I'll give you all the opportunity to, <laughs> to answer first. So let me... Hello, good afternoon. Yes. Go ahead. Oh, yes. Um, Alana Mills here. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, one of my um, issues is um, like, how do you make sure that the objectives are met? Because if it's like a lesson, you, you know, you should have objectives that you want the students to achieve. Mm -hmm. So how do you make sure that the, um, the lesson has, um, that the students are meeting the objectives um, at the end of the lesson and that they really understand so even when you are not present in real time with them, are they really understanding um, the lesson as it progresses? Good. And seeing some of the persons are saying the same thing. It's achieving the objective, concern that students may not understand the concept, um, concern who is actually doing the assignment, parents or students. Okay. Uh, Olika, you had your hand up. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Well, that was my concern. If the student or the parent or someone is helping them to right. ensure that they, what they give is a reflection of their work and not somebody else's. Okay. And I'm seeing last instant feedback. This defined objectives and students self-directed and disciplined enough to go through without a physical presence. Okay. So very valid concern, right? And we're going to see how we can address these concerns because I know that is one of the concerns, well, many of the concerns that I would have been hearing, very similar throughout. All right, so let's move on. So as many of you would have stated just now, you want to make sure that your students actually know what those objectives actually are. And in an asynchronous lesson, it is very important that your objective is stated. And we're actually going to see what this looks like. But you must have your objective stated because you're not in front of the classroom. And as every teacher, I don't, you know, no matter where you teach in the world, you would say something in a classroom, and two minutes later, somebody is going to raise their hand and ask, What did you say, Mr. Sir? So, in an asynchronous setting, you are not present. You are not physically there. You are not able to respond immediately. So, it is very important that your objectives are stated in the asynchronous setting. Now, you're probably thinking, do I then write at the end of the lesson, students should be able to do X, Y, Z? Well, it's not going to be written quite like that, or it may not be written at all, because depending on the age of your students, you actually may want to have either a little video or an audio that communicates what your objective is. So you think about your students, and you have to communicate your objectives appropriately to the students. So you have to use clear, simple language. You have to break it down into small chunks, and this is just general e-learning. Even for adults, if you ever notice a well put together e-course, it is often broken down into very small portions. And you should include audio or pictures to simplify instruction. And those of you who were here yesterday, I will have spoken about the fact that, that this generation, they are very visual. And so it is very important that we use as much pictures as possible and also audio. So you can simply record yourself. I mean, most phones, this is not something I'm telling you, go out and buy high-tech devices for. Most phones have a, a recorder. You go, you record your um, audio because what this allows is two things. One, parents are able to know what is required versus just having to depend on their child. As a parent myself, one of the biggest disadvantages I found is that I could not, if my children, because I have a twin, did not understand the instruction, I could not help them because there were limited instructions given on the platform that was used. So having the instructions broken down there, having it written and having it in an audio or visual video format, very simply written, 
or very simply recorded because you can have instructions for preschoolers because from the age of two, they go on to YouTube and they can find stuff right long before they can read. So you start with communicating your objectives at the beginning of the lesson. Okay. Right. The second thing you want to do, like any good teacher, when you walk into a classroom and you're going to start a lesson, your set induction is important. And I think a lot of teachers kind of forgot about that during this period. And we understand why. It was, you know, an emergency. Um, we, we were thrown into this online learning. And some of our pedagogy kind of got lost along the way. But one of the main things to have a successful lesson is remembering what you need. Your set induction. Your set induction is how am I going to engage the students? Why are they going to want to participate in my asynchronous lesson? So, I mean, we don't even have to, it doesn't have to be a big set induction, but how would you get your students to know what the lesson is about? Why do you need a set induction in an in asynchronous lesson? So, you know, let's say, are you seeing my little frog lizard, or I'm not quite sure what he is, playing football. I put that up and I said, what is the frog doing? I'm teaching birds. The frog is kicking a football, or I'm teaching something in Spanish, or maybe I'm teaching about insects. Something there that just grabs the attention of the students. Again, you would know your students' the age, you would know some kind of interesting video from YouTube so that they actually want to know more about the lesson. Your set induction sets the stage for your lesson. And similarly, in the asynchronous environment, if your set induction, the first thing that students see is interesting enough, they're going to want to find out more about the lesson. So it is very important that you think about how you're layering your lesson. So this is an asynchronous lesson. So this, this is not just sending home a worksheet. Because I know somebody said, you know, you're not, you're not so sure who is doing the lesson. And I will get to that in a little bit. So that's two. The third thing. You want to check for what the students actually know before you give them instruction. Don't you do that in a classroom? Pre-knowledge, you're going to teach them about agriculture. You're probably going to walk in and say, anybody ever help mommy or daddy with the garden? So you probably want to have some quick checks. And how can you do that? Again, with some fun, engaging things. So I have a couple of examples here. It says, caption this. So this is, of course, Columbus and they arriving on an island with the natives. And you tell them, caption this, that's a history class. And students are going to come up with whatever amazing caption. Now, the reason for the caption this is to see if they actually knew anything. So you give them the caption this before. This could be done in a Microsoft Teams uh, form where they send it to you, right? So they send the information to you you will be able to check to see what they knew before. And then, of course, at the end, we're going to talk about assessment. You can ask a character, a historic figure, a question. So you put some, somebody like this and say, what question would you have asked this person? You, and many of you are probably familiar with quizzes. Quizzes is a great place to love to play games because, of course, it's competitive and it tells them who came first and who came second. You can do that asynchronously. You can actually set quizzes for homework. So you can use that as a pre-knowledge. You give them three or four questions of just to get a feel of where they are at. And then, of course, you give them a post test. So you know that pre-test, post test. You can use Google Forms. You can use Microsoft Teams Forms. You can even ask them to do a short video or your recording about, again, a quick question that you want to just see what they know before you actually get into the lesson. Or a quick poll where you have ABC or you have some smiley faces about how you feel about this topic, etc. So you want to check to see what your students know before you actually get into the content. Number four, now you want to get into teaching. So how do you teach in an asynchronous setting? How do we transmit the content that we want our students to know? Well, some of us have been using things like presentation um, tools, such as PowerPoint, Powtoon, Google Slides. Depending on the age of your students, you can actually send the slides and tell them to do things. But you have to have it interactive, right? So the content should be easy to understand. Please do not send home a 50 slide PowerPoint or send home something that is so dense. Do not send home a PowerPoint that's filled with words, right? Because that's no different from sending home notes. You must have content that is easy to understand. So again, you think about your objective, include your visuals, include uh, your words. Right? I don't want them going to mind. I can't. and then focus on one to two objectives. 
and include checkpoints for students so that they also, for example, you can have one or two questions on the slide itself where you're asking them some questions so they can check for their own knowledge. Now, again, if a PowerPoint, because PowerPoint can be very interactive, if a PowerPoint is fun, a student is, want to, is going to want to go through the PowerPoint. So it's a matter of thinking about a nice context, putting some of their favorite stars um, on, the, on the slide, thinking about shows that they like. So of course this is, I mean, and we do this as teachers all the time, right? Your context is supposed to be something that the students are going to know about. We're not going to go into a classroom and talk about our favorite superstars from back in the day, right? We're not gonna talk about Backstreet Boys or whomever else we used to listen to, because they're probably not going to know who they are. So you're gonna make sure that the content is relevant to them, the visuals are enticing, and we have audio included there, maybe even a little music, and students are going to want to go through the material. And of course, you can use video, record yourself. I know some teachers don't like to do it, but I will tell you, your students do enjoy seeing you on screen because they're missing you. They do miss us. They miss having that interaction. So you can also record your video and you can teach a lesson. And I'm actually going to show you a couple of examples um, along the way. And there are some tools that somebody was saying that they weren't sure. They said it lacks instant feedback, but that's not necessarily so. If you use the tech tools, you can actually have a video where you teach for two minutes. A question pops up, the student gets it right, it goes on to the next section. The student gets it wrong, you ask them to replay the video, or in some context, you can actually send them to another site where it explains the thing further. So you can even do a lot of differentiation in this asynchronous setting. And these are just some tools. I mean, today's focus is not on the tools, right? But I'm just saying, we want to know that asynchronous teaching can work. And we're gonna look at the example. And then the last thing that you want to do in any lesson, whether it is in the classroom or in an asynchronous setting is you actually want to check for understanding. You want to be able to know how well one, did the student actually do the work? And two, did they understand the work? So was my YouTube video that I sent for them, was it a good explanation? Or okay, maybe I need to teach this again. And of course, you can use tools like quizzes again. Flipgrid is a great one where they have to record themselves. Now, with quizzes, it's very unlikely that a parent is going to sit down and come and play quizzes. It is, well, it is almost impossible for a parent to come and do a flip grid because that one, the students, you can ask them to show their faces, record themselves. I mean, you can tell a student's voice from a parent's voice. So you can actually ask them to do a video of the answer and you get to know, you will know for sure that it's the student. So you can ask them to explain a concept or to answer a question or to read their essays, etc. And there are also some others like Quizlet and Quizalize as well. I mean, there's tons of free text. As I tell people, don't start with the technology. Start with what objective you want to accomplish, and then you can find the tech tools afterwards. And the last thing, what can students do as a follow-up to the lesson? So you want reinforcement. Now, students are at home on their tech tools, and so you really want to make sure that homework is something that you know, I don't ever say I give homework, right? You give the students something to do. So let's play a game. Let's do a project. And you know, of course, you make the project exciting. Like, can you recycle something in your home to make something? Can you collaborate with your friends to do a video? Because all of them, I mean, they're not all, but they're like 95% of our population that will tell you they want to be YouTubers. So you let them collaborate in a video, play games. They like get to do experiments. And those are the types of homework that students, they're going to want to do. We need to start thinking about what our students actually enjoy. And that's how we get them to do the work. That's how we get them to want to come to class and to want to go through the asynchronous lesson. Now, one of the key things is that there are actually significant benefits to an asynchronous lesson versus a synchronous lesson or a live lesson, especially during this time. It allows for anywhere, anytime learning. So from my experience, what I've had is students would um, sometimes not be able to access the internet during the day or their devices because sometimes parents are going out to work and the devices, they need to wait until their parents get back home. So having the asynchronous lesson allowed for students to be able to do the work anytime, but sometimes they had to share with siblings who were in exam classes and so they got to use the 
devices. And I'm pretty sure if I were to ask you all, you all had many similar situations. Or it was a phone they were using, and obviously the phone may not have belonged to them, it may have belonged to the parents, so they, they weren't always accessible. The other thing that I found is that I have had students who came in late to school. So we had like, for example, some form ones that came in late. They came in after two, three weeks, but guess what? Because my classes were set up from week one to week, et cetera, right straight through the term, they could have gone back and they could have learned the work. They missed absolutely nothing. My live classes were recorded. My asynchronous classes were set up. So it allows for anywhere, anytime learning. It also allowed for my form five, who would have written CXP this year, to go back from work for the past year and a half and be able to go back and do all the revision because they had all the work laid out in Microsoft Teams. You can access materials when convenient. It's an opportunity to research answers. So again, because of the asynchronous setting, I would actually post my work on a Sunday and students had the whole week to do their work, like whether they wanted to do it Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, it didn't matter to me. You had one week to accomplish your work. And I generally did not have issues with students doing the work because they really had no excuse because they knew it was set up there every Sunday, a course would show up and they would see the work there. Their parents would be able to see what was due for the week. And it was broken down into nice small chunks. So they were able to feel successful once they finished one activity to move on to the next. So for some students who find it difficult, and we've all had those students who sometimes find it difficult to get, you know, to understand things they need time to process, the asynchronous lesson allows for that. If they need to listen to that YouTube video three, four times, there's nobody telling them, oh gosh, you have to listen to that three times. I got it on the first try. So it allows for that kind of learning. And of course, it encourages independent learning. Now, is this something that's going to be automatic to our students? No, it's not. It is going to take a couple of times to use literally every class. Uh, when I just started this, Every class, I would start the first five minutes, I would go through the layout. And I would say, this is the layout. Remember, this is what you do every five, every class. And then, of course, it became, they knew what it was. But my lessons were laid out the same way every time. Every Sunday, without fail, they knew to look for my lessons coming up. So I had students on Sunday evening, I would post them. Sometimes at 1, 9 p.m., I'm posting. I, and it made life easier for me because then I did not have to post during the um during the week because i would have posted all my work so somebody's asking what subject area i teach i teach french and i teach french to boys so you know <laughs> and and they, they they love it right so it is it was not an easy task but it it required dedication and it required me taking them through a process talking them through because even after three weeks four weeks, you would have had boys who still said, Miss, where you find this again? And you know what? I went through it. I went through it again. Because after probably two months, I did not get those questions again. And it has been working, as I said, for the last year. So we are going to jump in. But before we jump in, are there any questions about the asynchronous lesson? Now, on the 21st Century web website, there is a free asynchronous training, which I would have done last year. That is a more detailed version of this, where it actually goes through the asynchronous aspect. But because today's session is really about a practical example, I just wanted to do a quick overview. So are there specific questions about what I just went through before we actually dive into the example? So I will take questions now before we dive in. And participants, I'm going to allow you to unmute. Ms. Spear, I, I want to ask this question. Um, so you, you do asynchronous and you allow the students to um, a week, a period of time to accomplish the work, right? Mm -hmm. um, so how, 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 how is it done at your school? Right, so at, at do, our school? Also, do we also our do like synchronous as well, a, a structured timetable with that? Yes. And how does that work? How, how, how is that? married with um with, with that synchronous and asynchronous how do we do it okay so at our school what we did we had one synchronous period for the entire week per class 
So if I had five classes, I would have met with my classes synchronously for five periods. But whenever they were scheduled um, on the timetable outside of the synchronous session, it would be an asynchronous session. So most classes would have five periods. I would probably have two asynchronous and one synchronous with those um, students. And um, you know, people were worried initially that you wouldn't get the same amount of work done. As I told somebody, this is the first year that I've actually gotten so much work done with my form five because the work didn't stop. I mean, what I did over the vacation period, I did not meet with them synchronously, but I was able to post work that they could have gone on to do because they got so accustomed using, you know, being independent learners that they would have gone on and they would have done the work. So I was able to actually get them to do more work than usual. Um, and for the synchronous period, what I did was I reinforced what we would have done, and it was a, a time for them to ask questions, and it was a time for us to do more practice questions. So how it works is really like, I don't know if you all are familiar with the flipped classroom model, where you give them the easier stuff beforehand in the asynchronous setting, and then you check to see how much they really completely understand in the synchronous session, and they can ask questions. So of course, they could have also sent messages to me, um, which many of them did. If they had a question, they would send a message to me, I would respond to them. So it worked pretty well. I mean, I thoroughly enjoyed it. My students, based on the feedback I got from the students, I would ask them, you know, is this useful? Parents were very happy because it was very clearly laid out. So they knew exactly what to expect week by week. It was very, very structured. And that's very important that your, whether it's a synchronous or asynchronous session, structure is very important in a remote setting because they're not seeing you so it is very very important that you do this in a very structured manner so i hope that answered the question any other questions or oh, are we ready to jump into class notebook? has anybody used class notebook before you can raise your hand if you have anybody ever used class notebook Anybody? Well, I'm assuming no. Carla, you used it before. Okay. Carla, you want to give us any feedback how you found that was, or maybe no? Maybe? That was a no. That was an error. I haven't used it before. Oh. <laughs> okay. No problem. So great. So nobody has used Passable, but I'm assuming that you all have used Microsoft Teams. Some of you are using Microsoft Teams to teach your classes. Yes. Or you all were just here for the asynchronous part, but that's fine. <laughs> All right, but well, we're going to look at class notebook. If you are using Microsoft Teams, though, I would suggest strongly that you look at the class notebook because it is a wonderful way to organize your work. And uh, if you use Google Classroom, you can set up your Google Classroom in a similar way. All right, so the structure is going to be the same or any other platform. You just have to adapt certain features. All right, so just take a look at this. And then we'll get into the actual practical part. OneNote Class Notebook and Microsoft Teams, Two's Company. At Microsoft Education, we're strong believers in Two's Company. That means that sometimes our tools pair up to support your classroom. OneNote Class Notebook within Teams is one of those dynamic duos. So you have Teams, where you and your students communicate in conversations. OneNote Class Notebook acts like a digital classroom binder, giving you a place to organize course content and providing every student a private place to take notes. The Class Notebook tab is automatically added to your class team and lives in the general channel. You can start the setup process and be guided through a few steps to create a notebook for every student in this class. But for now, let's look at a class notebook that's already been made. As we dive in, remember that class notebook is organized left to right. These are sections. Sections in class notebook are just like dividers in a three ring binder. As we click through different sections, you'll see pages nested under them. The sections that automatically come with your class notebook are the collaboration space, where students can organize and create content together. As students work in this space, they may have questions or need to discuss a project. This they can easily do in a channel conversation. 
as a teacher, you can oversee work in the collaboration space and then provide support in channel conversations or private chats. Another section is the content library, where you can post important resources, handouts, and more for students to reference. All materials in this section are read-only and students can't edit them. Then, here are the private student notebooks. These are automatically created for each student in your class team. Only you and the individual student can see them. Students can use these personal notebooks to take notes, work on homework, and store research. It's a home base and prep space where they can develop their own work and keep thoughts organized. Plus, you can check in and provide guidance using one-on-one -on -one chat to answer questions or give feedback. This teacher has also chosen to add a teacher-only section, a little slice of solitude for planning lessons, developing content not quite ready for students, or anything else reserved for teacher eyes only. Need to manage your class notebook? Just select the class notebook tab in the ribbon to access it and make changes. Private work, collaboration, engaged conversations. Already your classroom currencies, now they've brought Class Notebook and Teams together. To study up on all things Microsoft Teams for Education, check out support.office.com education. Right, so that's just a little bit of what the Class Notebook is. And of course, once you actually get into it, you figure it out and you figure out other things that you can do. So once you actually turn on the class notebook, and we actually, I'm going to show you it from scratch, literally. And if you have a Microsoft team, I would want you to actually do it with me. So if you already have an FAC account, you can log into your Microsoft team and you're going to start and actually do it alongside with me. If you don't, you can just look on, all right? So, but once you actually activate your class notebook, because you can set up a class notebook and then activate it, every student in the team will have their own notebook as you would have seen. And the student notebooks are not accessible to each other, right? So if the student posts something in his home, his or her home section, another student can't see it. It's, but you can see what they post. Um, so you can actually check on their work. So instead of students having to send you these pictures um, via WhatsApp, which is what takes up your storage, or a student can actually send you an audio recording, a video recording, you can send everything right there in the class notebook. And the that you would be able to actually give feedback right there. You can give audio feedback, you can give written feedback right inside of the class notebook. Um, and you can have four spaces where you can distribute materials. So you'll have like handouts. So if you have a handout, a student can actually take that handout and put it in their notebook. Now, now of course, depending on the age of the child, I would not necessarily uh, use that aspect of it because then you know students may not necessarily go back to their notebooks to actually review, but they do still have access to yours. They also cannot change what is in your notebook. So you don't have to worry about people editing your notebook. And you can also include like quizzes. There are some things that integrate quite well into Microsoft Teams, such as Flipgrid, quizzes, of course, the Microsoft um, Forms as well. Uh, you can use Google, but of course, we Google and Microsoft are competitors. So the Google stuff doesn't work as well as the Microsoft stuff would work in MS Teams, right? Um, there's also a collaborative space. So you can even do teamwork within the class notebook. You can put a couple of students in a team and they have to collaborate in the notebook. Now, the thing is you can actually see which students are contributing to a project or to a discussion and you get to see it, whereas the other teams are not necessarily going to see what, what is happening. And then you have a content library that you can set up. You have a teacher space, sorry, that you can set up. So let's say you want to go ahead and plan um, a couple of things, but it's not quite ready. You can go ahead and plan and edit as you go. And only you would have access to that teacher space. So it allows you to be well organized ahead of time rather than just posting week by week, or rather than um, having to always be online with your students because now you can actually run ahead and post work. But of course, we must remember we're not just gonna post a whole set of stuff and we're not just gonna be, we're not gonna just be posting notes, right? We don't want to be posting notes at all. Very short notes if possible. So I'm going to actually 
go now. I'm going to stop sharing just for a little while. And we're going to go into Microsoft Teams. But I'm going to pause for questions. Any questions? So I was told that these functions are only available just with the MOE email. Yes. So um, for Trinidad and Tobago, if you have an FAC account, you will have access to Microsoft Teams. If you have an Office 365 account, you will also have access. So this is really for people who have the um, Office 365 account. However, the OneNote operates similar, similarly. So OneNote is a notebook um, that you can use. And it, I mean, it does have like the same features, like it wouldn't necessarily be set up for where like the homework section, etc. But you could just create tabs in your OneNote and you can use it to discuss because it's a collaborative space also. So you, you probably just have to do a couple of additions with OneNote that Microsoft Teams for Education already catered for in the classroom because it's literally called OneNote Classroom. So it's not very, very different. All right. So we're going to, so those of you who do have the class notebook, if you wish, you can follow the steps. And those of you who don't, well, you can just look at my screen and probably take some notes. All right. So this is what, so this is a, a, the ministry. Um, I didn't want to use my school uh, email, right, for obvious reasons. Right. So this is the Ministry of Education platform. So I, class, I created a team training for class notebooks. So you may want to create a team. You have a Form 1 class or you have a Standard 5 class or you have a Standard 3 class. You can go ahead and create a team, all right? Um, and you can create a team by clicking Create Team up here. Give it a name. And then when you click on that team, you're going to see this. So you're going to see General. You're going to see Post, File, Class, Notebook. So the first time that you go into this, you will actually see set up a OneNote class notebook. Now, I did not set it up beforehand because I wanted to make sure that I actually show you how to do it. Now, you would notice set up a blank notebook or set up from an existing notebook content. So let's say I already had a standard four class last term and they're going into standard five. I could have just, you know, because I wanted to carry across some of the content. I could go from an existing notebook, but we're starting from a blank notebook, assuming nobody has existing notebooks, right? So blank notebook. And you will see, it literally tells you, here's what you will get in your training for class notebook. They will tell you the same information that I just shared with you, right? You click next. Now, if you do not want all of the pre-made sections, you can actually take off some. Like if I don't necessarily want the handouts, I'm going to remove that. And if I'm not necessarily going to give them quizzes, I can remove that. If I wanted to add a new section, so I have something, maybe the science teachers want to add a section called uh, experiment, or maybe the um, language teachers want to add a section called vocabulary, right? So you can add sections as you go. So I'm just going to leave it for now, class notes on home, just to simplify it, but you can add sections um, that are suitable for your class. So you click create and it will now populate your class notebook, right? So sometimes this takes a while and I'm really hoping it doesn't, right? But it basically is going to populate your class. Now, when it does come up, right, this is what you're going to have. Welcome to class notebook, your one note class notebook, the digital notebook, et cetera, et cetera. But this is going to be the space where my students are going to be coming. So I am going to do some edits and I am going to put welcome to 21st century educators, right? And I can put my class rules here. So I can put um, whatever I want to put. So I can put, I'm going to delete all of this and I'm going to put Remember to check this space daily, or I could put my class rules, which is what I actually did. I put my class rules at the front um, so that that would 
that's what greeted them, you know, be arrived on class on time. Of course, I used a nice little visual with a bit emoji, right? So I had arrived on class on time with a little clock. Uh, make sure you have all your equipment ready, um, whatever your class rules are. So I used this case, I put a nice photo and I had a nice, so this is where they would land. You can put, if you have like an email that you need them to contact you at, you can put your email information there. So you can use this space as this is what I wanted my students to see every time they come to class. The next thing you would do is there are three little notebooks here. You click on this three, these three notebooks and where you're going to go is actually content library. Content library is where your students are going to come to get um, their content, right? So again, all of these things you can actually erase. So you could put, you know, welcome to class notebook. You could put a little tutorial here if you wanted. How is it used? When is my material going to be posted? So all of this can actually be erased. And you can put your photos, your pictures, your audio, et cetera, in here. And how I set it up, so you can do two things. You can actually set up, if you want, you can add a section here. So let's say I wanted to add term one, because I do, I, I would suggest you separate it into terms. You can have a term one. Then, of course, you will have a new section, term two, etc. Or some teachers actually use this section to separate it into um, topics, right? But I, I found it wasn't necessarily useful, but you can determine what sections you want in your using this space. So I'm going to show you it again. You literally right click and you will see new section. You click new section and then it asks you to type the name of your section. All right. Um, so we're going now to the lesson itself. So I go to my untitled page and this is my lesson for week one. So we are going to do a primary school um, lesson plan common and proper now. So let me see who was paying attention. What's the first thing I'm going to do? What's the first step in my lesson? Play objectives. Do what? Play objectives. Play objectives, very good. If I had a prize, I would have sent it to you. <laughs> well done. All right, so you, your first thing you want to do is have clear objectives. So, I mean, you can have a little fun, right? Like you can literally, um, let's say, insert a little picture. I mean, of course, you would plan your lesson beforehand, right? But let's just say I click from online and I'm going to just, let's just look for. So I use a lot of like Bitmoji and Pixton characters in this, right? So you could actually use your those kind of animations um, so that it's nice and fun. So let's just click this one. Right? And you have a nice little, like, we're going to talk about goals, right? So it, it shows up. And you can decide. So that every time, let's say you use this every time, your students know that is what is going to start your objective. Or maybe it might be some other image, etc. Now, if your students are um, younger students, you can actually insert audio. Right, I'm just going to show you again. Today, we are going to learn about common and proper nouns. So pay attention, boys and girls. Right. And the audio recording actually is in there now. Or I literally could have also put so the students could play it and they will hear it. Right. Today, we are going to learn about common and proper nouns. So pay attention, boys and girls. Right? So you have an audio recording, or I could also, of course, depending on the age of my students with older kids, I can literally put, today we will be learning about nouns, um, proper and common nouns. And of course, 
you want to have some little imagery. So you might put up a couple of proper and common nouns there, like a dog, you might put a street name. So again, you are going to, because of course, if you're learning about proper and common nouns, you would have learned nouns before, right? So you want to put up a couple of visual reminders around the objective. So, you know, you're just putting up things like a boy, a girl, a street name, a, a name of a country. And just so again, this is just your objective right then you would go to your after your objective set induction set induction well done right so what kind of set induction can we use to this any idea we're online the students are not going to be with us what set induction can we use in an online setting that will get the students attention a video. A, a video, right? What else? A song. A song. Picture. Right? Images. Use an animation. We could use. We could use a picture. Images. Picture. Sorry. Images like pictures. Images. images. Yes. So we could just put up images and ask a question. Right, so you all gave some really good. So we get, we have images. We can use a short video, right? Because they set induction, your video should not be more than one minute, so one minute or less, right? And of course, if it's going to be a video, not a boring one. <laughs> I like the idea of a song, so maybe find a song that actually talks about nouns, which of course the internet is full of them. Or if you're creative enough, maybe even a poem, a short poem. Like, you know, one of those haikus or one of those kind of like cute poems that actually tells you what a noun is. I'm pretty sure you could find one online, right? Um, you can even do uh, like at, at literally, even though they are in an asynchronous setting, you can actually have a little timer here and say, see how many um, nouns you can name, you know, using the alphabet. So A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and they have to call out now. Now, the thing is, you might be surprised that students will actually do something like that, but it's like fun because when you go back to class the next time, you're going to actually say, all right, let's go. We're going to play that same game that you did for the set induction. Give me a noun that starts with A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and your class is going around. And then, of course, they want to keep because they now say, oh, so the asynchronous class is now tied to what I'm going to do in the synchronous setting. All right. So you can have nice, some fun with the set induction. After the set induction, where do we go next? Pre -knowledge. Pre -knowledge. Previous Pre -knowledge. knowledge. Right. So previous knowledge. What do we want to know if we're teaching now? Proper and common knowledge. What do we want to know as their previous knowledge? If they know what's what's a know what a noun is. Right. So you want to know what is a noun. I am going to just literally ask you all to type in noun in quizzes. And you're going to see how many. Um, and I'm at, let, me, let me actually show you it. One second, I'm going to have to share my screen, right? So I'm going to just show you because a lot of times people think, oh my gosh, this is going to take so much time. So just to sh show you, I'm not cheating at all. And I didn't check this beforehand, right? <laughs> so I'm sharing my screen. Now in prison. And I open it and I just go through. Okay, is this something that I can give? That is uh gonna check to see their knowledge of their pre-knowledge. It looks so. See, it was the first thing I looked up, right? And I did not cheat, I promise you, I did not cheat beforehand, right? So you literally click assign homework and you put a deadline date, right? Because if it's asynchronous and it's pre-knowledge, then you, you probably give a day. You would want them to not have too much time to do it. And of course, one of the things, the great things with asynchronous work and quizzes, so we're just gonna put a random time and I'm just gonna click assign. You have some other things that you could check and I'm going to click share link and I'm going to go back. Are you seeing my Microsoft Teams? No, you will not see it. I did not share my screen. Let me share my screen. Right. 
so you should be seeing my Microsoft Teams now. And I click here, and I put a little note at the bottom. Let's see who will be the winner. How many of you have competitors in your classroom? Anybody has very competitive children in their <laughs> class that like to compete? Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. So if in the asynchronous, in the synchronous session, after you've had your asynchronous session, you announce or you post somewhere, even asynchronously, you post this somewhere. The winner of the quizzes for this week was Tom. You know, every time you have an asynchronous quizzes or an asynchronous game, because there are other games as well. Guess who is going to want to do their homework or going to want to do those previous knowledge quizzes? Every child in the class, because you're not making it sound like work. You know, and you could put, I mean, you can even encourage, you know, winners will be posted weekly or whatever. I mean, you can have some fun with it. I even for secondary school students, I would um make a big fuss about it. My top three students are, and it would be a big fuss. And then you know what they would ask me, Miss, who came fourth? And who came fifth? Miss, what did I come? Big children, right? So I know it works. So after that, you want to check. So you have checked in your previous knowledge. And then the next thing you do is what? What do you want to do now? Instructional touching. Instruction. So tell me how you're going to instruct them if you're not present in a classroom. PowerPoint. You can use a PowerPoint. What else? Video. Video. Now, I want to show you all something. So I, I went on beforehand and I just found like some cute videos that I thought were interesting enough to hold a primary school, um, right? So the good thing about when you insert YouTube here is it actually shows up right in the in the Microsoft platform book, right? So you have your video right here. Now you could make your own video. If you go online and you find none of these videos as interesting as you, you could make a video. You could actually do your instruction and you don't need any fancy equipment. You go on Zoom and Zoom, you literally press record. You can go in Zoom by yourself, press record, and you teach, you can teach from a PowerPoint. So that same PowerPoint that you're going to put up here, you can actually teach from the PowerPoint for five minutes or three minutes. And of course, you could be, you know, your personality then shines through and your students enjoy seeing it. So you could put your own video here. Now, one of the questions was, but then how do I actually know they're paying attention? Right? How do we actually know that students are paying attention? Well, there are many tools that actually allow us to check for understanding as students watch videos. And one of my favorites is actually called EdPuzzle. So this is a teacher who was actually teaching about nouns, whose video you can use. And I'm just going to play it very quickly so you can. Hi, I'm Heather Jenkins from Hand to Mind. Welcome to our Teach at Home curriculum. This is the fourth grade, week two, day five, literacy video. You know, today I was going through my photo albums and I found a picture of me in kindergarten. Hold on. Let me show it. And uh, I'm not sure why it's not um, why it's showing up like that. In, but let me share. I think it's probably still loading. So when I saw her video, I actually said that this is really nice. Are you all seeing my Ed Puzzle? Are you all seeing the Ed Puzzle on screen? You should be. Yeah. Right. Yes. So this is what she did as a teacher to introduce. Hi, I'm Heather Jenkins from Hand to Mind. Welcome to our Teach at Home curriculum. This is the fourth grade, week two, day five, literacy video. You know, today I was going through my photo albums and I found a picture of me in kindergarten. I like to call it Heather holding a crayon. You know, Heather and crayon are both nouns, but one is a common noun and the other is a proper noun. Join me today as we learn all about common and proper nouns. When we read or write, we usually come across common. So I'm going to just skip a little bit. 
So in her video, and you can actually do this for yourself, in her video, there are actually questions that are embedded in the video, and you can do this in Edpuzzle, where the students must answer before you proceed, right? So you know this it isn't it's, well. You can choose whether you can let them skip or not. You can actually take off this option, and they answer the question, which was the noun, right? So let me just click on it, and then I submit. And you, if you share this with your account, you actually get feedback from your students immediately. And you don't only get feedback in terms of if it's right or wrong, you get feedback as to how much time the students spent on a video, which of course is very good in terms of being able to see how much time they participated in your lesson. So this is just an example of one of the other things that you can use in terms of tracking your students. All right? So, any questions, or you can see how we can do in instruction here. Does this sound like something that you all are, you all think you can do? Does this sound too complicated so far? It sounds, it sounds like something. Yeah, I mean, the biggest part is planning, which of course, if you plan ahead of time, the rest of your term is much easier <laughs> because. You can actually plan ahead of, okay, this is what I want to do. And then you can get notice. I didn't say anything about creating materials. I mean, if I like to create materials, but the world of the internet is so wonderful. You don't even need to do that. You just need to know how to switch. Yes, Simo. I, I will be able to um, Could you just repeat where we'll be able to make that the questionnaire where they ticked the nouns? Oh, Ed Puzzle. So what I normally do, I will share the, the first document that you all viewed. All of those tools are actually in there. So you will have a copy of it. So I will send you all an email with the link to all of the tools that were mentioned. Okay, Leanne, excuse, just one question, right? Um, I've never used Microsoft Teams before, so I just want to make sure we're on the same page. The class notebook that you're talking about is found within the Microsoft Teams and it is different from OneNote? So it's the only difference is that this one is actually set up for education, but you can set up your OneNote similarly and just share it with your students. Ah, okay. Do you have, I if see. you have an FAC account. I do. You will have this then. Okay, so I just, I've never actually, um, you know, explored much into it. Uh, right. So I guess um, once you're on that, you can have the class notebook, as you said, just for education. And the one note, the one note, what is that recommended for? So one note is used for like businesses. So Microsoft oh. was originally invented for businesses. So it's a collaborative mm -hmm. notebook. And then of course Microsoft branched into education. So class notebook came out after one note. All right. So, so you would recommend that. If you're using Microsoft Teams, Class Notebook yes. is the way to go. Yes. All right. For sure. Excellent. Thank you very much. No problem. Um, Leanne, mm -hmm. um, if you're using, if you are using um Google Class from Google Meet, mm -hmm. um, can you you can you do this whole procedure of um the lesson plan and stuff in it? Yes. You can yeah. do that in Google Classroom as well. Um, there is not there. They don't have a class notebook, but Google Classroom has mm -hmm. a space that you can post. So it is basically the same format. Okay. So after you post and you've checked, right? Because you're checking, so you have formative assessment going on with your Ed Puzzle. What's next? After you do your formative assessment and check. Before you get to homework. Formative now, assessment. Formative, right? You have to assess. Yeah. Um, you can, of course, use quizzes again. You can use um, Quizlet. You can use, some people use Kahoot. Um, I love GimKit. It's not free, but I like it. Um, you also have Blocklet. All of these are nice gamified 
um, options. That students love. <laughs> I mean, and they will ask you to play it. I've had students literally say, Miss, can we play in your class? I'm like, no, bye. But you can also have offline assessments because we don't always have to have the students online to do these things. What kind of offline assessments can we give apart from Whoosh? Anybody? If we were doing now, what kind of offline assessments can we give? As in, the students don't have to sit in front of a screen. We can make a video. Yeah, video. We can make a video. What about a collage? Where they go and take a couple of pictures of, of things in their homes that are a common noun collage and a proper noun collage, you know. So, I mean, you know, you can think outside of the box, or you can even, they have to do an ad or a, a you know, a promo, like they have to come up with something, or uh, they have to draw something that's selling um, a proper noun or selling a common noun. I mean, you know, you can get creative because students, I mean, this is an opportunity for us to be creative in the classroom and learning is, is, is able to take place in a different way. So we can assess the students, we can have a drawing, right? Where they draw proper nouns and common nouns and then they take a photo of it so they're offline. And then we tap into students' different abilities. We can also even send them on a scavenger hunt for proper and common nouns that are, exist within our, um, our house our yard right so we could literally tell them go and take a picture they have to find five common nouns that are green or you know we could make it exciting right so we can even send them on a scavenger hunt and they have to listen the things so we get them moving because i don't know where we got this idea that for teaching online we can't have movement right so we can do other things and then of course your homework well this would be more your homework right um, and you don't always have to give homework, all right? But your homework can also be to do something that is in preparation for the next class as well. Yes, Brittany. Hi, good afternoon. Let's say they, um, they do the collage for homework, right? Mm -hmm. Where would they post their, um, their collage? Right, so good question. So, uh, you are not going to be able to see this here because I don't actually have students in here because I did not use my school account. But if I were to invite students, the list of students would have populated here. And you would have seen there's a homework section that they can post it. So they would go to that homework section. And just like this, it would show up just like this. They post their homework, so they upload a picture, etc. And you alone would be able to see their homework section. So they would name it homework from it or whatever title you give them and they can upload their homework whether it's a video file uh audio file whether it's a link from somewhere else if they create google slides they can actually post it here and you can go in and correct their homework and give them feedback so i normally actually have students even during well this is the thing that, but you can actually give a student um homework and that's what i've been doing students have been posting their homework in um, so like essays and stuff that I have to correct, situations I have to correct, even audio files that I have to listen to, it's all been done in the Microsoft space. Um, or if they have a link to something else, they post it here so I can go to that link and, and it will take me to wherever they have their homework posted. So you, they have a homework space that only you and them can uh, monitor. And you can so correct. Is it, sorry, is it that, um, the lesson, like how you have the lesson here, is it that the lesson will come up like this in the homework space and they would just put the collage under, or is it that they would have? They is go it that, into um, your library. They will be going into your library. So when they click right. on week one. So right. very good question. So what I did, I remember I told you all, you would have to actually explain to them how to access it. So you would actually say, go into term one, week one. If you want to put week one and put the date, that's fine. And then you can put week two, week three. And this is this is outside of, this is what I actually did. So I posted here, but I would also have a page um, that was called weekly breakdown. Um, 
not weekly breakdown, sorry. So I would post some, um, I, I can't remember what I put. So I put breakdown for the term and I would put week one and I would just recap. Like if, because we have timetables, so this is for secondary schools. If I had them on a Monday, I would say this is what part of the lesson I expect you to do. If I had them on a Tuesday, this is what part of the lesson I expect you to do. And if I have you on a Wednesday, this is what part of the lesson I expect you to, to do. And if I meet you online on Tuesdays, I would say meet me online at, and I would have had a time for them. So I would actually have the breakdown of the lesson here. And then for week two, I would post week two. So this would be like a summary of what they would have done for the two. And then, and I know teachers might say this is a lot, those of you who use MS Teams, you also have a place where you can post. So I would have new conversation and I would literally repost week one, week two, week three. But the summarized version. So in other words, my students had absolutely no excuse to complete week that was given. And that's basically how you do uh, asynchronous lesson where you can track students, you can set up your objectives, you can still have fun without you, you can still be assured that they're learning. And even if a student, you know, because things are happening, miss class for a week, the work is still there that they can go back to it. And that's one of the really great reasons I like this classroom setup because it you can continue doing this. So even if a student came in in term two, they can go back to term one and work through the work that they missed. And it's all there. So that's it in terms of the session. So any questions before we leave? Any thoughts? anything popping into your mind and before you leave i just want to if you do have a microsoft account you can actually get today's session verified so please do you can go to this website which i'm going to post in the chat and you can put in your um, code and you will get verification because you can do uh, Microsoft training yourself, but you will have gotten, would have gotten verified that you did do training with a uh, Microsoft um, team trainer. All right, so I'm going to post in the chat. So please, before you leave, take it down, take the link, and I'm going to share the code so that you can get verified that you actually did a, a training. All right. So somebody, I just saw, I saw somebody asking a question. Let me just send the code for you all. So please make sure to do that. And there we go. Right, so make sure to save this information so that you can get verification that you did do um, a course with a verified training. All right, so let me just see. I saw somebody posted something in the chat. You're most welcome, all right? And of course, ladies and gentlemen, those of you who were here yesterday, once again, thank you for coming. And please go and check out our website. Um, I do hope that you enjoyed the session and I do hope that you found it very valuable. And of course, if you have questions, you can always message me on Facebook or you can send me an email, but do consider please supporting us by becoming a member. Um, this recording is available for members and it's only seven US a month or 49 TP to help support us because we want to continue doing these sessions. Look out for a session on Pentacool.com where we're going to be talking a little bit about blended learning on August 26th. That's going to be a Facebook Live and Zoom session. So I'll see you then. Somebody had a question. Yes. Uh, uh, you, Ms. Marshall. Yes, Mr. Marshall. <laughs> Marshall is fine. I have a question. When you are completed with the class notebook, how do you save it? It saves automatically. Oh, so if I navigate away from there, it's not lost? No. OK, lovely. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Hi, good afternoon. Yes, good afternoon. 
Hi, I have a question. Um, will you ever be doing any training in the future with respect to um how to use like Animaker to create videos with Animaker and like how to know things for like certain inductions in the future? Do you think you'll ever have any right. training so, sessions? So we actually do offer, we have the option of doing one-to-one -one sessions. If you are mm. interested in doing one-to-one -one sessions or if we, we do small group trainings as well. So last year we did quite a number of Google Classroom um, training. We, and it, anything that you basically want. So that's my field, that's ICT. I mean, I'm always doing research. And as I said, anything that I'm teaching you is stuff that I would have used in my own classroom and could tell you it works or I would have trained other teachers and gotten feedback. So you can do a one-to-one -one session. I do offer free mini cult mini consultation and it's not expensive <laughs> right i know teachers um so you can do training i do training for schools as well um so i would have done training on e-testing we also have other persons that we we do work with who can do training sessions and of course if you all follow the facebook page we always have tech companies coming to do sessions. So if you have a particular um, person that you would like us to contact, we'll reach out to them and see if they'll be willing to do a session. So we can do Powtoon, we can reach out to Powtoon and ask them to do a session. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. What is um? What is the website? What do we have to do with the website when we go on to it? For the education, this one you just oh. sent. Yes, yeah, so if you click the code and you log in with your Microsoft um, team, you will see um, verify. You will see um, under your name. Uh -huh. You should see verify um, a course or something like that. Okay, verify a course. Yeah, let me just get the exact thing. Uh, you will see. Redeem achievement. Redeem, redeem achievement. Thank you. Yes, that's why you. All right. Any other questions? And thank you very much as always for being a wonderful audience. Right. So also, even if you're not going to become a paid member, so you just go on our page and just tell people about us and you know tell them about the benefits. If you benefited, <laughs> please leave a little love note for us. All right, about what we do so that we can continue to do All right, so thank you very much. I will let you all know, you all are on the system, so I will let you all know any upcoming um, sessions that we do have. All right, I'm not sure if somebody hands up still. All right, so that's it. You're very welcome. <laughs> Bye-bye, everybody. Okay, thank you. Excellent presentation. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. If you have a question, I'm seeing people, somebody's hand up. You can go ahead and ask. I'm not sure if this hand is still up. Good afternoon. Very good session, indeed, and fun. Thank you. I'm excited to want to teach now. Um, I wanted, I missed yesterday's session, which was so interesting about the animation. Right. Can we catch that again, or what is possible? So we do have it, but we posted it only for paid members. So if you're willing, you can become a paid member. It's the seven US a month, 49 TP, or we do have the option of a yearly package of 420 and you get all of our sessions, even past sessions, health and wellness sessions, um, and digital resources that we've created that you can use in your classroom. So if you're interested, you can send an email and we can chat about it. Thank well. you. You're welcome. All right, everybody, I'll see you all and I will send the email with all the information. Hey, Leanne, before you go, can you just repeat what we had to do with the verification, please? Thank you. Yes, when you go to, did you see the, do you, you have the um, website? Yes, I do. Right. It should ask you to sign in with your Microsoft email. So you can right. see the email. Right. And under your, you should see your profile. Uh -huh. you should redeem achievement code. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. You put the code right there. All right, thank you much. You're welcome. Thank you. All right, everybody. Bye-bye. So